That's right. Thank you. So I'm a user experience designer and not a content strategist. I think we have a lot in common, and I've learned a lot from you the past couple days. So yeah. Uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you very much for helping me figure out all this tech stuff. And uh, thank to Sasha and all the organizers here who have done a great job putting on a wonderful event. And more than anything else, thank you. Um, you could have been anywhere in the world right now and you decided to be right here with me. So I'm going to take all that love and give it right back to you. <laughs> all right. So let's get started. Do you want to? There you go. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's get started. So what I want you to do is imagine that I've handed you a deck of cards, okay? And I've given you just one instruction. Take this deck of cards and put the cards in order, okay? Now, some of you might split the cards into two different types. You say there are red cards and there are black cards. So I made two piles. Here are all the reds and here are all the blacks. And some of you might say, well, there are four suits. There are diamonds and hearts and clubs and spades. So I've made four piles instead of two. And some others of you will say, well, wait, the cards go in numerical order, so I'll put all the twos here and all the threes here, and I'll have whatever it is, 13 piles, I guess. 13, 14? I don't know. And some will say, wait a second, no, no, no. There's red and there's black and there's numerical, so we're going to mix everything up, and I think the majority of you would say, well, there are four different suits, and each suit has a numerical set, so I'll put the cards in this order. Now, I want you to imagine that you've put the cards in order, and I've asked you to then hand this deck of cards to the person sitting next to you. And I said, find me the ace of spades. Now, you have a new deck in your hands that someone else organized for you, and you take this deck and you flip through and you say, oh, well, it's a numerical and by suit. You flip to the, the spades and you find the ace. Most of us imagine that we can do this very easily. It's not a problem. We immediately identify the pattern. We can understand what someone thought when they organized this data. And we can find what we're looking for. But my question today is, what if you couldn't? What if your cognition worked in, in a way that made it more difficult for you to find this information? So today I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to tell you about dyslexia, what dyslexia means. I'm going to tell you about universal design and the principles of universal design. And I'm going to tell you how we can use universal design to create a better world, not only for those who have dyslexia, but for everyone. So to begin with, I wanted to mention a friend of mine, and the reason I started working on this, I'm actually not dyslexic, but uh, I was in Scotland, and I was looking for the best fish and chips uh, in Scotland. And I met a guy who told me he was an information architect. And he told me, I'm really great at what I do because I'm dyslexic. And I said, that's pretty strange, right? You, you're an information architect and you're dyslexic. And he said, look, if you were to hand me the cards, I would make 52 groups of one because all the information is different. And only once I had seen all the information all in one place in every individual group, only then could I create a hierarchy for that data. So Francois Rushdie, who works at Border Crossing Media, he would he would go into rooms and cover the walls with the information in order to assemble the organization for the data, for his content. I guess this is his content strategy? I don't know. All right. So, like I said, I'm not dyslexic, but that's how I got interested in this topic. And I did what I believe to be the largest UX study on dyslexia. Um, and from that research came this presentation. So this is all based on original research. For anybody who's interested, and this is so weird, but I've offered this everywhere I've gone to say I will open my research to anyone who's interested. And up till now, no one's looked at it except to me. So if you're interested, it's yours. Just let me know. I'll link you to the, to the GDOC. So what is dyslexia? Now, when we talk about dyslexia, and like I said, I'm not dyslexic, um, what, we're, what we're really talking about is the human body. And the human body has lots of inputs. We have taste, and we have smell, and we have touch, and we have our, our sight, and we have our hearing. And all these inputs contribute to, to, to our brain that processes this information. 
And when we talk about cognition, and in this case, dyslexia, we're really talking about a brain who has trouble cracking the code of the inputs that it receives. Now, I know this is a dumbed-down version. I'm not a neuroscientist, but this is the best example I can give you. Now, when we think about dyslexia, we generally think about something like this, right? Words that are, have letters that are flipped around or whatever it might be. But this isn't a vision problem. And I, I want to I state that very clearly because we generally look at something like this and think, oh, okay, well, they're seeing something different than me. But it's not. They're seeing the same thing as you, but their brain is processing it in a different way. So to them, it may appear like this because the brain is processing words in a different way than how we might process the words. And I don't really know what the opposite of non-dyslexic, I don't know, non-dyslexic things. Now, one in 10 people are dyslexic. And I don't love to use statistics, and I actually think this is a very low number. But the scale of dyslexia is very wide. So there are some people who are incredibly dyslexic, and there are some people who are barely dyslexic and don't realize that they have dyslexia even. And one of the things that struck me when I did my research is not only how large this number is, but how varied dyslexia can be. So when we tend to think about this as just this written process and they're reading words and they don't quite see the words correctly or whatever it may be, but the fact of the matter is that this includes spelling, right? So have trouble putting down words. So there are dyslexics that can write perfectly and have trouble reading, and there are dyslexics that have trouble writing because they have trouble reading the words. Trouble with maps. So somebody told me I need to get to a certain address, and I tried to write it down, but I couldn't spell the word right. And now I need to find it on the map, and I can't find it. Left and right dyslexia is another issue that people have brought to my attention recently. Clumsiness. I never expected dyslexia, dys dyslexics to tell me that things fell out of their hands. It's like something we don't associate with dyslexia whatsoever that can be debilitating. Trouble with math. This is like a lot less talked about uh, than, than trouble reading. We think about children in class and they have trouble reading and the teacher hands them some assignment, but we don't talk nearly enough about numbers. So now I ask you to spell my address and to write down the house number and you still had trouble finding it on the map. Short-term memory. So I hand you something to read, and you get to the bottom of the page, and it took a lot of effort, but you read it, and you can't remember what you read. And finally, organizational skills. Now, I want to note that dyslexia isn't exactly a disability. Many dyslexics claim that it's the, the key to their success, and I think they say, like, there are more dyslexics that are running Fortune 500 companies than non-dyslexics. So this isn't necessarily something that has to be debilitating. Organization, I think, is where, where you see a lot of coping strategies, like I mentioned with my, my friend Francois. By the way, the fish and chips in Edinburgh is not so great. <laughs> so, so I wanted to give the stage here to some, some dyslexics that I interviewed. And, and one told me, I make a lot of mistakes while writing. And when I read, I, ha I, I have to always concentrate a lot and stupid small things disturb me. Now note the spelling errors here, okay? And I think even more poignant, someone wrote, someone wrote me to this, I'm scared to pay things via internet or to take money from a machine. Now you're all content strategists and you're designing content for people to absorb, to digest, to read what it might be. Can you imagine this person trying to, to digest the content that you create? It's trouble. It's troublesome. So enter universal design. Now, what is universal design? Universal design is actually a very simple principle that's incredibly complex to execute. It means designing a single design that works for the widest possible audience, okay? We talk about universal design, we talk about a plan. We're gonna take this singular design that works for the widest possible audience, and that's how we're gonna approach the problems that we wanna solve. And the way we test this plan, the way we test how universal a design can be, is through accessibility. So universal design is a plan, and we measure that plan by looking at the periphery, looking at the far edges of the spectrum. Now, Tim Berners-Lee, excuse me, sorry, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, 
who, who in, in, helped to invent the World Wide Web. He said, the power of the web is in its universality, and access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. And when we started designing for web and creating content for web, this is where we started, right? We started with this place and we said, regardless of race, religion, national origin, wherever you are and whatever language you speak, you know, we're going to create this, this plane, this place where everybody can be there and it's egalitarian and it's equal. But we've reached a point of, uh, where the playing field is no longer level. And universal design will help us level this playing field. Now, this is actually my favorite slide in this presentation because we really do tend to look at this woman in a wheelchair and think that the wheelchair is what inhibits her from climbing the stairs, but it isn't the wheelchair that makes a place inaccessible, it's the stairs, right? We designed the building, we just didn't design it for the people that may want to enter that building, <laughs> okay? And it's not the user that makes the web inaccessible, it's the designer. It's not your users who may have trouble digesting the content. It's you're the, you're the content strategist. You're creating the content. So you have an obligation to reach those people regardless of what their cognitive state may be. So if a design is accessible, it's not necessarily universal, right? If I have like hearing aids, I won't have super hearing, superhuman hearing right now because I don't have, that's, that's solving an accessibility problem. But if a design is universal, meaning it works for everyone, then it must be accessible. So I'll show you some examples. In the 1960s, Berkeley, California had a problem that they had a lot of people in wheelchairs, and the wheelchairs were riding on the street because they couldn't get up onto the sidewalk. So there's you know, a truck and a wheelchair. It's not a great combination on the street. So they installed this, oh, you can't see the laser pointer. All right, so they installed this, uh, this like ramp, right? It's a pretty simple thing. You see it everywhere here in Germany as well. And suddenly, everyone was able to use the street more conveniently. If you were riding a bike, if you had a baby, baby carriage, if you're moving apartments and you want to wheel your stuff up onto the curb, these were major, major problems. And they were solved by a more universal design. So swimming pool. Actually, most accidents in a swimming pool happen on the stairs. So in entering and exiting the swimming pool, you can, I hope you can see like way in the back, there's a ramp here that goes in. So imagine you can't swim or you're elderly, right? A six-year-old who can't swim that wants to walk gently into the water. An elderly person that may have trouble going up and down a ladder and I can't, I just cannonball in. I can't, I can't go into a pool and a ladder. So this design was, works better for everyone, right? It's a simple design solution that works better for everyone. This actually here for, for content, there's a layer of braille over the like cab information in Chicago. I'm from just outside Chicago. And so we have like the same content that works better for those who are sighted and those who are blind at the same time. Now, I want to mention this as well because the Dialogue Museum is right here on this street and I went yesterday and did a two hour tour pretending to be blind basically. You're like in a dark room and they take you around with a walking stick and you, you walk through. And I asked our blind guide in the end. So you have this thing that like beeps, it makes this like clicking noise, like the tick, 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 right? So you have this auditory clue that tells you it's safe to cross the street and you have something you can see that tells you it's okay to cross the street. But I know there's also a, a, like a touch-based thing that vibrates like underneath so you can feel it. And she told me one of her biggest challenges here in Germany was that at night they turn off the sound so as not to disturb people. Well, she's blind, so she doesn't know if it's night or not, I guess. But she, doesn't, she just doesn't hear the sound anymore at the street crossing. So she has to use a, like the vibration underneath the the box. So here we have something that's, that's created for those with disabilities, but works better for me too, right? Because I walk around with like Michael Jackson in my headphones. Don't laugh. I, was, I love Michael Jackson. So I, I have Michael Jackson turned up in my headphones, and I may not hear that it's okay to cross the street, but I see the visual clue. Now, it wasn't created for me, 
but it was a universal design that worked better for me and for others. And we see this in, in, in digital as well. Fingerworks, which is a company that was purchased by Apple in 2005, used gestures to help solve problems with carpal tunnel syndrome. So if you had problems with your wrist, they said it was more difficult to use a mouse. So, hey, we have this great idea. We're going to use these, this thing we like to call gestures on touch interfaces. And there are a lot of companies that did similar things, but Fingerworks was one that was purchased by Apple. And a lot of what we see today came from this idea of we have to level this playing field so that people who have carpal tunnel syndrome and people who don't have carpal tunnel syndrome will both be able to operate the same piece of technology. So Luke Robluski, who's a well-known user experience designer, he, he's begun to say that he tries to design for one eyeball and one finger, right? So that this is the most universal, I guess, we have as a design principle today. There's one eyeball and one finger, and he's designed this application called Polar. If you have an iPhone, you should download it. It's really fun. I don't have an iPhone, but it's still really fun. So you basically just scroll up and decide between two things, like you know, hot or not, or whatever it might be, and then you just keep scrolling. So it's, it's very, very easy and ergonomical, and it works for an enormous, an enormous vertical. So how do we use universal design to design for dyslexics, and in turn, everyone else? Right? How do we use dyslexia as a lens through which we can look and, and create a better, better world for everyone, right? a better way to use the technology that we all have with us today? So the first principle, and there are five principles I'll go over. There are actually seven principles of universal design, and I think five apply to the web, so I'll go over the five. The first is flexibility. So, whoa. All right, I don't know what happened there. All right, so IMDB is something that came up again and again in my research that dyslexic would tell me, well, I love the Internet Movie Database, and why do I love it? Because I can get to the information I want to get to in a variety of different ways. Right? The interface was flexible. So if I wanted to search by actor or by movie or by genre, keyword, year, I don't know what else, <laughs> you know, any way I could think or process the information, I could find that information no matter what. So if I was thinking about animated movies that came out in uh, 2010, then I could say like, oh, that Toy Story 3 came out in 2010, right? So the second thing is simple and intuitive. Now, I told you a moment ago that we had designs that are designed for one eyeball and one finger. Okay? But there's, there are other body parts that we have to discuss. The only intuitive interface is a nipple, and after that, it's all learned. When we talk about things that are intuitive, we tend to think about a two-year-old that you hand him the iPad and he like, can flip through the pages of the iPad. But that's because the iPad was easy to learn, not because naturally we have all known for a billion years how to use an iPad. When we talk about things that are intuitive, we talk about a simple learning curve, okay? Things that can be learned easily are intuitive. Things that can be learned easily are simple. Some of the, some of the things we use, Facebook, for example, is incredibly complex, but it's easy to learn, right? So we talk about layouts that are simple or easy to learn. We talk about hierarchies of, of information. That the, the layout enables people, it opens doors for processing information. And I saw these are directly from my research as well. NPR came up again and again, as did apartment therapy. So you can see the, the layouts are relatively similar. Right? We have this simple top navigation that's just the most high level you can get, and then news here on the side. And here we see something similar as well, the highest level navigation and secondary navigation on the side. And I know this is very basic, but these are layouts that help people to process information. So if you want people to digest your content, if you, if you want people to engage with the content that you create, you also have to provide them a format that's conducive for, for receiving the signal that you're sending. So perceptible information, and this may be the most relevant to content strategists here. We need more signal and less noise. 
end of story, right? Full stop. More signal and less noise. So Nest is a great example of this. This is the temperature. That's all you need to know, right? Okay, that's what you want to know. That's what you want your thermostat to tell you. You want to know what the temperature in the room is, and that's exactly what it tells you. Nothing more and nothing less. These are airline boarding passes. I flew here from Tel Aviv through Istanbul. <sighs> it's just a mess, right? This is an absolute mess. Now imagine being dyslexic and reading, trying to read something like this as well and having trouble with numbers and words, and now you have letter combinations and number combinations and people scribbling over all your stuff. It's, it's designed for a computer from the 70s. It's designed for a computer from the 70s. It's great. I wasn't even born in the 70s. How do you like that? <laughs> all right. So there you go. We have these things, flight card. I think we're actually making some improvements. I've seen KLM has done a little bit of a better job um, with this kind of stuff. But we have these applications that basically say, like, wait, the information is too difficult to process, and we're going to make it more perceptible and easier for people to understand. Okay? We've done a great job with landing pages. Anyone here who's ever worked on a landing page knows you just cut everything else, right? We need to download it now. We need to know what it is. And we can throw a picture of it there, and that's it, right? Like, that's your website, and it works, because people know what to do. And if I got rid of all the words on this page, you would still know I'm supposed to click here to get that. <laughs> right? So you, were, you spoke about the Pinterest yesterday and translating to 33 languages. So just get rid of the language. People will know what to do. They'll see that red button, and they'll just go like, all right, that does that, and that's the end of it. I'm kidding. So we have readers like Pocket and uh, the iPad Reader. I think it's actually just called Reader that can strip down the information so you can get rid of all the noise. So Pocket is actually, is anybody here use Pocket? Am I the only one? Oh, I'm not the only one. Thank God. All right. So Pocket's a great, great way to recycle information and to, to save what you love. And it gets rid of all the nonsense and the junk on websites that you don't want to read. So I don't have to see crazy flying banners of sparkly gold dust. I don't know. <laughs> I've been, I can't imagine. Yeah, it's just, dyslexia, by the way, has a like high comorbidity with attention deficit disorder. So now you're saying, like, it's difficult for you to process the information and you get distracted. So these kind of readers in, in Pocket were something that came up again and again in my research for easier ways to, to receive the signal. I used the open dyslexic font uh, in this presentation. So for those of you who are designers here who are like, why is he using that ugly font? I can't believe this. I'm going to talk to him after this and say that to him. <laughs> this is what happens every time I give this presentation. Somebody comes up and goes like, Man, I was so ready to talk to you and tell you that that font was awful until you told me it was like the slide. And so there you go. So I used open dyslexic. There are actually several dyslexic fonts. One of the things, if any, does anybody here write code? You can include this first in your CSS list of fonts so that if, if you have the font enabled, then your website will automatically render in open dyslexic. And if you don't have the font, then it'll just render in whatever the standard format is. So that's one way to be more universal through code. I know we're not... Uh, Tolerance for error. Oh, this is actually the most controversial of, of all of these. But when we talk about oh, sorry, we talk about tolerance for error, what we're saying to people is, it's cool. You can screw up, nothing's gonna go wrong. If you have any place on any website, mobile, application, whatever the next generation smart watch bracelet, whatever it is, where you type something, it better have spell check. Okay? Even people who, who aren't dyslexic have trouble spelling, and if you want people to reach the information you're trying to, to steer them toward, spell check is an absolute necessity. Absolute necessity. Now for the controversial part. Are you sure? Did you really want to call the driver? Do you want to cancel your order? It's directly from Amazon. I actually did it once, too. I had to cancel an order. And like 15 minutes after I ordered something, I said like, oh no, I have it already. And then I had to cancel an order. And I was so happy they had that. It just like saved in their server for a few minutes before it like, actual, like actually processed. So there's this idea, at least in, in user experience design, where we say like, if you have to ask someone if they're sure, then you didn't do it right. You don't need to check. 
So this is a bit controversial, at least with UX audience. You guys are so polite. It's great. Everyone here is just like, oh, yeah, let's do that. That's great. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, but I think we do need to consider the context and the, the, the breadth of our users come from a variety of backgrounds. We can't always judge what's going on in their lives and what's going on around them. So allowing a fallback for tolerance of error is absolutely critical. And finally, equitable use. This is my, my final one. So people, people ask, well, which user's cognition is best? And the answer is very simple. There is no best cognition, okay? We're human beings, and we come in different shapes and sizes, and we have different abilities. And there is no best here. And that means we have to design for everyone. And we have an opportunity, and I love speaking to content strategists as well, because you guys hold the keys, right? If content is king, you're holding the crown jewels. We can create a better world for everyone. And it's something we throw out there all the time, and we say, and we say, like, oh, design can change the world. But it's true. It just is. And if someone wants to call me naive for saying it, then that's fine with me. Then I'm the most naive guy in the world, because I believe that this stuff can actually help create a better world for everyone. So thank you guys very much. Um, if you haven't already, follow me on Twitter, right there. <laughs>